So, um, hi everyone. Um, I'm, I'm Shahab Bakhtiari. I'm a postdoc in uh, Blake Richards lab at uh, the Neuro and Milo in Montreal. Um, so what I'm going to talk about to you today is a bit different than uh, probably the most, like the, the rest of the talks that you will hear throughout the, uh, this event. I'll try to give a brief um, overview of, of kind of projects that we do in Blake Richards lab. Uh, basically, we short to use um, neural networks uh, modeling, um, use neural networks in combination with uh, different neural data sets in order to first uh, develop better understanding, better models of the, uh, the brain using uh, neural networks, and also uh, extract important features from the brain that we can use for developing better uh, brain-inspired uh, AI models. So the type of models that I, I use in my projects are very similar to what um, uh, Christian described. Even we use contrastive learning as he alluded to, um, but the, the type of application is very different. So uh, today I'll give a very short uh, overview of a recent project that we did uh, uh, for using neural networks to model the, uh, the visual system. So um, there are two uh, organization principles uh, of visual cortex. One is the hierarchical organization and the other one is a specialized uh, parallel pathways. So if you look at, for example, uh, the, the human visual system, as you're seeing in this schematics, there are at least two parallel pathways. Uh, one is the ventral or what pathway, uh, which is in charge of, uh, you know, responsible for object categorization, face recognition, scene discrimination, and, and so on. And then there is the dorsal or where pathway, which is in charge of processing the visual input for um, um, guiding actions, following moving objects, perceiving motion and moving stimuli and so on. So they're, they're specialized for very different um, things. And, um, and they're both hierarchically organized as, as you're seeing in this schematic, for example. So a model of the visual system, a neural network model of the visual system that we want to develop should have to some extent uh, the same type of characteristics. Um, it should have uh, parallel specialized pathways and it should also have this kind of hierarchical organization or its hierarchical organization should to some extent capture the hierarchical organization of the brain. Um, so we are working with task optimized neural networks. These are neural networks that are optimized to do a specific uh, perceptual task or motor task. Um, but then at the same time, they are used as models of the visual system. So this is one of the, the most uh, uh, well-known examples of this, this topic. Uh, Yamin, Dan Yamins and Jim DiCarlo in 2014, um, they showed that if you train a neural network to do object categorization, uh, the, the, the model turns out to be a good model of the ventral pathway in, in primate's brain. So the representations that different layers of this model learn just after training on object categorization are good predictors of the responses of the areas along the, uh, the ventral pathway of the monkey brain. Um, and also there is a, a, a roughly uh, match, uh, a, there's a rough match between different layers of the network and different uh, um, hierarchical levels of the, uh, the, the, the ventral pathway. The early layers are more similar to early areas and deep layers are more similar to deep areas, uh, the, the late areas and so on. But when, you, when it comes to other parts of the, uh, the visual system, for example, the dorsal pathway, this model doesn't perform as well. Also, when you look at another species like uh, mice, uh, this model is not very successful. And most importantly, it's because uh, the, the, the objective that the neural network is trained on, here being the object categorization, is not ecologically very relevant to a species like mice. Um, so we need a better uh, uh, cost function for training the model. Also, the architecture is different. It's, uh, it still has the, the specialized pathways. It is still hierarchical, but in a different way. Also, the dorsal and ventral stream do exist in mouse brain. And there, there, there are many studies that provide evidence for the dorsal ventral equivalence of uh, uh, pathways in mouse brain. In particular, a, a recent study um, by Sit and Gord, um, they, in this study, they um, did wide field calcium imaging from um, all the area, the visual areas of the mouse brain, while uh, mice were presented with random dot motion stimuli. 
So in primates and, and also in, in um, other mammals like cats, for example, it has been shown that um, um, dorsal areas are very, dorsal pathway areas are very responsive to this type of a stimuli, unlike ventral areas. So they use this stimulus to see which areas are more dorsal-like. And uh, what they observed was that uh, areas like this AM, this, this visual area, is very responsive to this type of a stimulus, uh, showing that this is probably the most dorsal type area in the mouse brain, while an area like LM is, is not that responsive to this stimulus. So it's a very, uh, an area very similar to ventral areas. So this type of dorsal ventral specialization does exist in the mouse brain. And for a model of the mouse visual cortex, we need to have these kind of specializations uh, as well. Um, okay, so um, to, to uh, approach this problem, to have a neural network of the mouse brain, mouse visual system, we need a, we didn't, we need a data set from a mouse visual system. We use the uh, Allen Brain Observatory open data set in which they recorded from um, all um, different areas of the mouse uh, visual system while uh, they were they were uh, presented with different types of stimuli. Uh, here in this study, we used that part of the data in which natural movies were used for um, as as visual stimulus. And uh, so this is basically the, the data that we used. So now we also need a neural network, right? We are we are developing a neural network model of the mouse visual system. So I will not go into the technical details of of uh, the modeling part here, but. Just um, um, very roughly, the model is trained to do a prediction, to solve prediction. Uh, so um, the model learns to predict the next frame of a video, given the present and the past frames of the same video. The model is trained end to end with, uh, um, with predictive learning. And we use this part of this convolutional fit forward model um, as a model of the visual system. We take this model, this part of the model, this convolutional fit forward model and, and use it to compare it with different parts of the visual system in mice. Um, now we have the data set from the mouse brain. We have the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the neural network that is trained. Now we need a measure, we need a metric to compare um, um, these, these, the model and the brain. And for that, we use representational similarity analysis. Um, so, again, I'll not, I'll, I won't have time to go into the details, but basically when you have a, a multidimensional um, space of the neurons, either the real neurons or the artificial units in, an, in, an, in a neural network, every frame of this video is presented with a dot. You can, you can, you can think of it as being presented by, by a single dot uh, in this high dimensional space of neurons. And as you move throughout the movie, uh, you're actually moving along this trajectory. So what we do in this analysis is that we first characterize the geometry of this trajectory um, um, in, in the format of a matrix called representational similarity matrix. This is a, a, a sim, a basically a summary of, of how a movie is presented in this population of neurons, let's say in V1 neurons in the brain. We also do the same thing, the exact same analysis for let's say one layer of our neural network. We get a similar matrix, RSM matrix. Now we have an RSM matrix that characterizes the geometry of representations in a layer of a model and in an area in the brain. We compare, we correlate these two matrices and get a measure of RSM similarity, which is the metric that we use to see how well our model is modeling um, this part of the brain. So this is the metric that I will use throughout the talk. So, okay, um, let's look at uh, let's look at one of the uh, models that we train. So, as I said, we, we have a convolutional neural network, a fit forward model that's trained to do a prediction task, right? Now we take this very simple fit forward convolutional neural network and compare it with the uh, different areas of the brain. Let's say that we first look at three of the most uh, ventral areas in the mouse brain. We compared with these three areas. So look at this plot here. Um, what I'm showing you is the similarity of all the layers of the trained model with uh, these three areas. So here I'm comparing with this LM. What we are seeing is that as we go, uh, as we move through the network, the similarity increases and then plateaus or, or goes down to some extent. The same happens for the, the, the two other areas. 
which is uh, a good sign means that there is somewhere in the model that has a, a good similarity with, uh, with this, these, these areas of the brain. Also, if you take this maximum value for every area, we can compare our model with all the other models. Um, this is a model that I started with, uh, the, the model trained on object categorization. This is an untrained neural network, a neural network that is not trained, just randomly initialized, and a, a classic 3D Gabor uh, model. And what we're seeing is there is that our model is doing uh, much better than the other models in this, uh, in this comparison with baselines. Now let's look at two other areas in the mouse brain, um, two of the, uh, um, the most um, dorsal type areas. Now what we see is that um, as we go through the network, the similarity actually is going down. It means that whatever this neural network is doing, however it's processing the visual input, it is getting farther and farther away from whatever this AM, for example, is doing in, 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 in mouse visual system. So this shows that even though the model was a good model for um, the ventral type areas, this is not a good model for dorsal areas and it can't capture whatever this part of the brain is doing. Um, also, if you compare with other models, like if you, if you see here, you can see that the model is even doing worse than an untrained model. So our training is not doing a, a good job for this part of the brain. So um, one reason that this could happen as, as we hypothesized and, and tested, and I'll show you in a, in a bit, is that what, will, what happened is that uh, probably the architecture of the neural network couldn't capture these different types of representations on processing. So we needed a, a, an architecture that at least roughly mimics these kind of specialized pathways, these parallel pathways. So we replaced the architecture with an architecture that has now two parallel pathways, and it gives it the capacity to, um, to develop different representations. Now, when we look at this, the, the, uh, the similarity of this network, this train network with different areas of the mouse brain, we can see that, um, for example, for this area, we can, like for this three area, we can see that the red pathway is uh, more relevant. It's, it's doing a good job in modeling these pathways. And also for the uh, dorsal areas, now we see that the blue pathway is doing a better job. Um, so by, with this architecture, now we can see that the model learns different things across the two pathways. And interestingly, whatever it learns in the two pathways is also more similar to the, uh, um, to, um, uh, to these dorsal and ventral streams. So one question that we can ask here is that, okay, uh, we know that this pathway is similar to ventral pathway. This pathway in the model is similar to the dorsal pathway. Now, what are they really doing? What type of information is there in, in, in these pathways? What we can do is that we can evaluate these networks on downstream tasks. We know that in the primate brain, for example, the dorsal pathway is good for motion discrimination. Um, so we take the two pathways of our model and test them on this task, right? We, we present this stimuli and train the model to do, um, with just a linear readout, we train them to, do, to discriminate the direction of motion. Also, we know that the ventral pathway is good for object recognition. Uh, so again, we take the two pathways and uh, train a linear classifier at their outputs to, um, to classify the type of uh, the types of objects in this data set, the CIFAR-10, for example. What we see uh, as a result of this analysis is that the dorsal light pathway, the blue pathway, is actually doing very well in motion discrimination, but the ventral pathway is doing much better in object ca categorization. So, so this is consistent with what we know from the dorsal ventral areas in the primate brain. It is consistent with uh, the, uh, the, the comparisons with the neural data set uh, of mouse brain. Um, and it kind of confirms that these two pathways are, the, are similar to the ventral and dorsal pathways in the brain. Now, the last thing I wanted to uh, show is that, okay, if you take the trained model, okay, and, and measure how similar it is to the ventral and the dorsal uh, streams in the brain, and measure this throughout the training of the model, what we'll see is that there is an anti-correlation between the similarity to the ventral pathway and the similarity to the dorsal pathway. So it means that um, um, as the model is being trained, if it, if it becomes more similar to, let's say, dorsal, a dorsal area or dorsal pathway, it loses its similarity with ventral uh, areas. So 
there is a conflict between these two types of representations. I don't have time to get into that, but, but this is an interesting uh, observation. Now, when we use a model with two pathways, we see that this anti-correlation decreases, meaning that now these two types of representations are kind of disentangled across the two pathways. And the, the, the architecture lets the model or enables the model to learn uh, different types of representations. So to just uh, to sum up, uh, we show that predictive learning with an ANN architecture that roughly mimics the anatomy of the visual system makes a good model of mouse visual cortex. Loss function matters in the training of the neural network. I didn't get into this part of the study, but we showed that supervised loss function doesn't do the job. Um, um, and the special temporal dynamics of the data, the training data is not enough. Architecture matters. The architecture of the ANN should capture important features of brain anatomy. Now, what are those important features? It is, it is an open question and it, it, it requires more investigation. But one thing that we observed here was that at least these parallel organizations, these parallel pathways are important uh, for capturing different uh, specializations. So yes, um, so thank you very much for listening. Um, and I wanted to thank um, all my collaborators, uh, especially Blake Richards, my, my supervisor. Um, and I couldn't get into details. So if you're interested, please um, contact me and, and we, can, we can discuss it more. Thank you so much. Thank you very much um, for, the, for the presentation. Um, we can have just maybe one quick, quick question from the audience and uh, transfer the rest to tomorrow's poster session. Sure. Okay, if somebody wants to jump in. Um, um, there is a yes. question in the chat, yeah. yeah. Um, do both the dorsal and ventral CNNs also contain uh, recurrences? Um, so it's a very good question. Um, the, the, the thing is that the two pathways are, are separate, but they will, they, they're concatenated on top. And on the very top, you have a recurrent neural network that is processing the concatenated version of the features from the two pathways um, in order to do the prediction task. But within the two pathways, they're separate and there's no recurrence. They're just 3D convolutions. 